No, well, it really tire of words because it's just a, a play on words. It was just a break from that magnificent power. They wasn't tired. They didn't need the rest in the sense like we need rest today. It was a different kind of rest. Correct. When you study in the Judaism. And what kind of rest is it? Celebrating what? Creation. The creative power of God. It's a time of worship. To say, mountain, boom, mountain existed. Apple tree, boom, apple tree exists. Do we really think about that? Do we really reflect on that during the day? The creative power of God to just think something and it's reality. I saw a hand over here. Yeah, I think uh, to that point of the creative power of God, the one way I think of it is it's really celebrating God's sufficiency. Because it's really God's power and that creative power that is his redeeming act in our lives. And that's the that's the part it's easy to forget is it's his sufficiency that is, is all consuming. That's a good word, sufficiency. Very good word. And finally, the word establish. Do you know what the word establish means? To permanently stabilize something. Permanently. That's right out of the concordance. To permanently stabilize something. I don't know about you, but I need to stabilize it. Another biblical word for stabilizing is the word seal, S-E-A-L, seal. Let's take a look at some scriptures and I need some volunteers. The first one is John 6.27, volunteer for John 6.27, over here. Uh, Ephesians 4.30, volunteer for Ephesians 4.30, over here, thank you. And finally, Revelation 7.3, Revelation 7.3, Tom, thank you. Let's begin with John 6, 27. This is Jesus speaking. Notice the wording here. Thank you. Why should we focus not on temporal things, but eternal things? Do the eternal things last for how long? Forever. And what guarantee we have that we will experience that? God has sealed who? Jesus. And subordinating ourselves to Him, we experience what? The sealing also. Okay, uh, Ephesians 4.30, over here. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Thank you. And finally, Revelation 7.3. Say, <clears throat> do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. Thank you. The word seal means to seal or secure or permanently stabilize something for security and preservation. That's right out of the concordance. For security and preservation. What does security mean? God 
has taken the initiative to what? Call each one of us to participate with him in perfecting, confirming, strengthening, and establishing us. What is our contribution to this participation? Subordinating the will to his will, which is what the word means. Then we'll be ready for what? Redemption. That's it. That is it. Why is the Apostle Paul reminding the Galatians that it is God who is what? Calling, calling them. Because there's someone else calling them. The devil. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28, 29, and 30. Let's read the detail that the Apostle Paul goes into in his farewell visit to Ephesus. Acts 20, 28, 29, and 30. Who would like to volunteer to read Acts 20, 28, 29, and 30? Volunteer. Okay, right over here. I don't know your name, but again, welcome. welcome. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. How about that? Yes. Did God inspire Paul to write that to the Ephesians? Yes. Paul wrote a letter to the Romans saying, My plans are to come visit you. My plans are to go to Spain. Well, he never made it to Spain. And when he visited the Romans, he went there as a prisoner. Why? Because he kept putting out fires wherever he had raised the church. And he had to go back and back and back and back. He made three trips to Galatia. Why? Well, let's read it. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Who would like to read that? Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Mary Jane. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Brother, if I could add one thing. When, when you go back and study in what was happening at the time when this was happening, there were 21 different sects of Judaism. So... All these works, and Jesus identified all these religious people as being of the devil. And but the good people came out of that group. But it's this it's the rollback. I mean it's the same thing today, but the devil's seeking whom he may devour. You got a lot of mouthpieces with education. There's no spirit and no power. What these people had that we read about in the New Testament had the real power of the living God. And that's why they're in the book. But we have all these people with these smooth words saying all these things, but ever, all these religions are collecting money, even our church. So what does it, what makes what you just said effective in getting the Galatians to what? Turn to a different gospel. Turn away. Ravenous wolves, he tells them, are going to come on. And then he has something amazing. Perverse people from amongst you. Some of them what? Will come up from even amongst you. From amongst you? Yeah. That's where we become vulnerable. Amen. That is the <laughs> issue. That is the issue. Okay. Amen. So the Galatians were being turned away by another gospel 
or more accurately, a perverted gospel. How do dishonest people get away with printing counterfeit money? Study the real thing. Close to the real. It's very difficult to distinguish between the real and the counterfeit. counterfeit. And if you don't know the real, you can know the counterfeit. Impossible. Excellent point, Carl. Yeah. Nothing can be called the gospel unless it professes to give salvation as a yeah. free, free gift. gift. Period. Let's all turn to Romans 5. We're going to read three verses. I'm going to read, and I'm going to ask you, with the fingers of one hand, to count how many times the word free appears in three verses, and how many times the word gift appears in these three verses. When you get there, say ready. ready. Romans 5, beginning with verse 15. But the free gift is not like the transgression, for by the transgression of the one, the many died. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The expression to the many means everybody. It's a Greek expression. 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Finally, verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. How many times does the word free appear? How many times does the word free appear? Twice. I see two fingers sticking up. That is the correct answer. How many times does the word gift appear? Five. Correct. So seven times the Apostle Paul says the same thing within three verses. When God inspires a writer to say something, should you and I pay attention? Yeah, sure. But when he says the same thing seven times in three verses, do you think that that's something that we better understand very, very clearly? Amen. What is so appealing about the counterfeit? I can only answer that question personally. I can contribute to my salvation, which in my case, I'm not speaking for you, in my case, is a lot easier to do and more enjoyable than dying to self. Amen. Maybe that doesn't feel apply to you, but it does to me. The Galatian Christians were being what? Turned away from the gospel that who had taught them? Paul. By a counterfeit that involved what? contributing to their salvation by taking the initiative to do something. In my Sabbath school class last week, someone made the point. I, I really like the way they said this. They said, when, when you believe that you contribute something to your salvation, you're putting God in your debt. Because that kind of obligates Him to take a piece of what you do. Which, if you think the idea with God in our debt is kind of absurd, number one, but number two, it nullifies something as a free gift. Free or a gift, if it's in my debt. I have not what? Contributed. What I'm saying is what? God, I appreciate Jesus coming to this earth 2,000 years ago. And all of the stuff that we went through. But I'm sorry, that's just not enough for me. I need more. I want more. That's what we're saying. Isn't that what Adam, Eve said in the Garden of Eden? Here we have this beautiful creature perched on this tree. 
And he's speaking to her. Immediately, what does human logic tell you? Well, that thing hasn't died. And now I find out that the reason that God doesn't want for me to give this tree is because He doesn't want for me to know as much as He does. I don't like that, said he. Give me that fruit. That's what you and I say when we enter into speculation. People constantly ask me, well, Chuck, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I say, I don't. Why? If God did not see fit to inspire a writer to record something in the Bible, I'm not going past that. The real gospel is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. First Corinthians 2 2. Amen. Which is the same gospel that Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Isaiah preached. Amen. Let's read it. Acts chapter 10, verse 42 and 43. Acts chapter 10, 42 and 43. Who would like to volunteer to read that for us? Acts chapter 10, 42. And 43. Bob? 42. And 43, please. Acts chapter 10. 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained by God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him. Amen. God's been preaching this since when? I followed Adam and Eve. Followed Adam and Eve. What are the biblical consequences for preaching another gospel than the gospel Paul preached to the Galatians? Who would like to read Galatians chapter 1, 8 and 9? Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Come. But even though we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel, contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. Thank you. Do you know what the word curse means, or curse? In Greek, it's anathema. Do you know what the word meaning of the word anathema mean? anathema means? Bam! Excommunicated. I'm just reading the biblical definitions to you. In preaching another gospel 2,000 years ago in Paul's day, brought about the curse of God, excommunication. Here's a question you don't have to answer, because I'm not going to answer it for you. But it depends. The answer must come from each one of us. Should the same standard and consequences apply today? Well, sometimes I think when people really stand up for the simplicity of the gospel, with certain groups of people, they can't they can't take it because it's too simple. Because they worked hard in many years. I've heard many Christians say that I've been in the way for 40 years. And I heard a preacher say, Yeah, you have been in the way for 40 years. Because the simplicity, that's what Satan wants to do. He played the same game with the Jews. He's doing the same thing today in the churches. If you speak so simple, it makes some people draw up so much they eat the cover off the seat. But I'm just saying, God has set us free. He died with His Son to set the whole world free. But the thing that religion does is put things on people. But this is something God calls people. But uh, the greatest deception is going on right now. And, uh, okay, you know, so the question is, what were the biblical consequences for preaching another gospel other than the one that... Paul you were in the first. 
And, and should that standard yeah. apply to it? That is the question. According to the Bible, has the way of salvation been the same in every age? Yes. Let's take a look at it. 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 through 12, a volunteer. Volunteer for 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 through 12. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about the glorious salvation of God. <clears throat> For you, they wondered at, at what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in the advance that Christ's suffering and his great glory and his great glory after. <clears throat> They were told that the message was not for themselves, but for you. Now this good news has been announced to you by those who preach in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching to see these things happen. Thank you. Does God save us differently in the Old Testament than the New Testament? No. Our spiritual brothers and sisters that go to church tomorrow teach dispensations. The word dispensation means that God saved people differently in the Old Testament up until Jesus came on the scene. And then since Jesus came on the scene, he saves the human race differently. Unfortunately, that's not biblical. And the proof is, we're just going to dip into very briefly Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. But the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, through faith, preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So that they which be of faith are blessed with whom? Believing Abraham. Believing or faithful Abraham. It hasn't changed, and it's not going to change. And any change is what? From God. A different gospel. Cursed. Yes. Cursed. That person should be what? Banned. Anathema. Or excommunicated. Those are strong words, but we're going right to Scripture and looking at the definition of these words. I'm not inventing anything here. That's why I'm giving you all these Scriptures so that you can look them up for yourself and let the Holy Spirit impress you as to what is truth. If Paul had preached a gospel different than Abraham's in the Old Testament prophets, would Paul have been accursed by God? Yes. yes. Again, should the same consequences and standard apply today? That's for you to decide. That's what Paul is saying in verses 8 and 9. Someone may say, but Chuck, we're living in the United States of America where we have a constitution and a second amendment which says we have the freedom of speech. True. But should we associate freedom of speech with a secular topic that we have the choice of having an opinion about and distorting the inspired Word of God? Is there a difference yes. between secular topics and the inspired Word of God? Yes. yes. I agree. Galatians 1, 8 and 9. Paul is stating that anyone that preaches a different gospel than he has taught the Galatians becomes the means of fastening others to this curse. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> the curse is to teach others that they can and must contribute by taking the initiative to be saved. That's the curse. How are we to understand Paul's expression, even if an angel from heaven comes and preaches to you? How are we to understand that? The devil can appear as an angel of light. Very good. 
Is there a possibility that an angel from heaven could preach any other gospel than the true one? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Although it wouldn't be a recent arrival from heaven. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 11, 13, 14, and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15. We have a volunteer to read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13, 14, and 15. Anyone? Carl. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his minister, ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty clear language. What did Jesus tell us in Matthew 24, 24? False Christ. See, where did he false Christ? False atheists? <laughs> huh? False atheist? No. Yeah. Someone want to read that? Matthew 24, 24? Matthew 24, verse 24. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible even the other. So we're adding here not only a false gospel, a counterfeit, but we're also <coughs> adding what Jesus said, which is what? Visual things that Satan is capable of confusing us and leading us in the wrong direction. Is it possible to be deceived as long as you understand God's Word? No. no. Yes. If you, you can understand something, but if you haven't received the true spirit of it, you're in deception like the Pharisees and Sadducees. That's what he pointed out in the days of Noah and all these other things. Okay, so, I'm making it... I'm making a distinction yeah. between knowing something and understanding God's Word. Because it's assuming you're understanding God's Word that you have accepted as truth. That's correct. And then the next thing is bearing fruit within that structure of what the Gospel taught. With no power and all these things that were still deception in these bodies of believers and was so simple when, when they preached the beginning gospel and they had the Holy Spirit but it's all watered down now with all these other things and uh, so that's what's happened in our own church okay. you know there's no power it's all words okay. and no spirit okay I'm not going to get into evaluating our church yeah I'm just saying that's what we're trying to do is get this thing well, right in our lives I think that's why we come to church I think that if we understand the concept here of a counterfeit gospel I think the Holy Spirit will impress us how we can apply that Amen. to our time yes. today. Right. Yes. Amen. Okay. Uh, let's read verse 10 of Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Who would like to read that for us? Patty? For I now persuade men for God, for do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would be, I would not be a by servant of Christ. Everyone hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay. What is Paul saying here? Do you want to please men? Wasn't him, yeah. but God that's done the work. Who was Paul pleasing when he was headed for Damascus with orders from Man. the Man. Supreme Court? And how about his own personal ambitions? Yeah. Man. Well, Jesus summed them up. They're of their father, the devil. So he was part of that whole realm of teaching. It was man's way to find God, and they did it their way. Very plain. So Paul is saying, if I were still trying to please men, do you think I would have become a bond servant 
price. <laughs> that is a contradiction. Mm. I think he's contrasting the troublemakers that are plaguing the Galatian church to his gospel and his work. He's saying, the gospel that I'm preaching to you is not a gospel of performance, not a gospel of...